Hello. Hello. <laughs> so as uh, as we said that uh, my name is Hanabi L. Sanders. I'm a musician, educator, entrepreneur, activist, cultural producer, and the director of the social enterprise Harambe Pasadilla, which creates, organizes, and manages activities and events showcasing music and dance and arts, theater, and film that focus on arts from the African diaspora. Our mission is to build a society that, build, that values and supports and empowers artists while making Afrofusion arts accessible to as many people as possible. My activism manifests in a number of ways, including my music and collaborations, and I believe in equality, and I believe that we have more in common than that which divides us. And I'm really excited to be here to introduce and welcome the award-winning alto saxophonist, MC Soweto Kinch. You know, he's one of the most exciting and versatile young musicians in both uh, British jazz and hip hop scenes. Undoubtedly one of the few artists in either genre with a degree in modern history from Oxford University. He has amassed an impressive list of accolades and awards on both sides of the Atlantic, including a Mercury Prize nomination, two UMA awards, Awards and the MOBO for Best Jazz Act in 2003. In October 2007, he won a second MOB award and, and at the O2 Arena London, where he was announced as the winner of the Best Jazz Act category, fending off stiff competition from the likes of Wynton Marsalis. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> hey, How are you today? I'm great. I'm really looking forward to getting into this, into this chat. Probably a good idea to tell you quickly how this article came to be and mm -hmm. the thought process behind it. Um, as Nick mentioned, I came and did a gig up in Durham a couple of years ago. And it was a great connection, actually. And throughout that whole year and over the past few years, I've constantly made the connection of an elision with the sort of music that I want to make and the sort of social commentary that I like to make as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, for better or for worse, I've often been put into that category of political rapper or political musician, etc. Um, when approached to write this think piece, obviously, like everybody, I had a lot more time to think than before 2020. Uh, this moment of lockdown afforded me the time to really consider what my, my priorities were, what were the things that I was prepared to lose and had to be prepared to lose, and those things that um, I thought were important, even more valuable to cherish and to treasure and, and to, to protect. Um, and I also had to radically rethink the way that I would stage and perform work in the future. So I started live streaming every Monday, just putting out stuff on Facebook and YouTube, just to keep a conversation going with my audience. But something much bigger and more involved is coming up in the next few weeks. In fact, I'm hosting my own online festival called Black Peril. Black Pearl 2020 to be specific and we're going all around the country to historical sites with dancers, musicians, where if you don't know, uh, happy to tell you how to be over, a uh, hundred years ago there were race riots up and down the country from Cardiff, Salford, Hull, not, not, not the Notting Hill riots, not Toxteth, not Brixton, not the Mark Dudden riots in 1919 and in fact in two successive years in 1920 and 21 and so um, it couldn't be more timely to stage a festival like this, but also the thought process around it, considering everything that we're dealing with with Black Lives Matter, the murder of George Floyd, the topping of the Edward Colston statue. History and who owns it is in a state of flux. British identity is and should be in a state of flux. And I think musicians and artists, it's time to make a, an intervention into that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I hope that wasn't too waffly. It's an interesting. No, we've got a lot. <laughs> it was fantastic. You, I mean, I mean, your article is absolutely brilliant. And and being originally from America, I mean, it shed a lot of light on on Black British culture and history for me. So it was absolutely fantastic. You know, fantastic. You said in your article there is is an opportune moment for artists to shape the way public spaces are seen after lockdown. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? Because I agree with you. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think just one of the most immediate things we noticed just in our houses, if we were privileged enough to not be a frontline worker and at home, to hear birdsong and to mm. notice that patch of grass and the wildlife at the bottom of your garden, if you're lucky enough to get to have one. <laughs> um, the minutiae, noticing the small things that you normally walk past in a hurry on your daily commute. 
And I think that affords us an opportunity to reframe the public space, the way that we view that street in the first place. I've been jogging, I've been doing all sorts of things that I told myself what I was going to do for many years, but only finally got around to in, in lockdown. Mm. And I think start from the micro and extend into the macro. I think noticing that I am more responsive to sounds around me, more responsive to art around me, that should then inform the, the work that I want to make. And if we don't have venues and plinths and galleries and white box spaces to exhibit work, then what's wrong with our streets? What's wrong now everybody's kind of having this discourse online. What's wrong with designing new theatre spaces, gallery spaces, artistic spaces to express ourselves? Absolutely. And I'm just for this interview, I'm just going to keep pulling ideas from your from your article because it's just it covers so much, so many things. And I'm sure folks who have read it are curious and folks who haven't read it will be curious. So you say um, tradition breeds excellence. Wow how profound <laughs> and can you talk and, and talk about the paternalistic nature of well-funded arts organizations when it comes to their relationship with neighboring communities you know do places need to look at the people and local traditions in order to shape their cultural identity rather than looking into institutions or external examples of best practice hmm. great question let's, let's unpack a lot of that the first quote actually isn't, isn't from me. I can't take all the credit. I think I heard it from Winston Marsalis, um, musicians of his ilk, that tradition breeds excellence. And it's quite manifest in the examples of jazz music, uh, the mm -hmm. idiom that I'm most familiar with, that successive generations have built on a body of knowledge and then passed that on to their, to their offspring, even if they're not related, right? I'm Louis Armstrong's offspring or Hugh Masekela's offspring in a, a more transcendental way. Um, and there is a tradition there, there is a lineage that gives me a sense of perspective, mm -hmm. a sense of strength and position and a sense of direction. Um, so that's what I mean by tradition breeds excellence. To contextualize yourself as a musician within, within inheritance just makes the statements that you want to make have far more gravity, far more weight and a lot more reach than they are if you're just sort of island operating in a silo. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of that relationship with well-funded institutions, paternalistic or otherwise, with communities, mm -hmm. I think we should start to radically reevaluate what attracts people to these large institutions and high art, as I, the term that I use quite, quite liberally in the article in the first place. So if I can go on a bit of a digression, I think we all saw David Starkey's recent outburst in a podcast conversation where he was talking about one Slavery can't have been genocide because there's still so many damn blacks around, etc. And, you know, not for the first time in the past decade, he's completely shown his racist true colours beneath this mm -hmm. respectable veneer. But then you think, what's the type of history that he's been invested in? I studied history at university. I'm a keen amateur historian. Um, why the insistence on the history of kings and queens, of lofty aristocrats and their foibles and successes or triumphs and whatnot and completely ignoring the complex and rich social history of England. What draws people to that particularly whitewashed view of history? And I think it's the same impulses that draw some people to opera, to ballet, to high art. And it's a terrible dereliction of those art forms in the first place because opera, uh, ballet, they had they were demotic. They had a popular following in the 19th century. In fact, there were riots sometimes after these, these performances. So mm. these art forms have been wrested from the people and turned into some proscenium arch sanitized version of themselves that deliberately alienates sections of the community. Now, I'm not blaming anybody specifically within these institutions, but we shouldn't be naive as to what attracts certain people to ballet, opera, classical. It's the attraction of being able to enter a world divested of blackness, divested of community, divested of, of low culture, and instead a sort of comfortable space of, of higher culture. Until we really understand that, developing a more equitable relationship between these venues and the communities is going to be difficult. Um, yeah, I hope that addresses the question. Yeah, that also kind of speaks a bit to this idea of multiculturalism um, and it's and it's being, you know, part of, you know, British, you know, British cities for you, you mentioned in your article for over 500 years. And this idea that, you know, the work, you know, arts and artists from the 
working classes, you know, really should look to debunking these myths, you know, and maybe it will also help, in my opinion, with the social uplift and with the, with the raising of confidence and, you know, um, not, not just confidence, but just self-perception and, and just loads of, loads of ideas so around social uplift. And as the old adage goes, you can't be what you can't see. I think those well-established venues can lend their gravitas and the sense of, yeah, heaviness to the art that's already existing around them. Whether it's Katak dance in the South Asian community, whether it's sound system culture, dub plate culture, West Indian culture, which hundreds of years old, uh, West African cultures that exist in the communities around these venues, well, there are traditions already that are already breeding excellence and to give them the rubber stamp, the seal of approval, and of course the, the funding, the patronage that we require would be a trans transformational step. You mentioned um, something about um, uh, putting, putting, paying for the jewels in the crown. <laughs> and I just have a question. Uh, you know, this sector often uses the conflation of arts and heritage. You know, what can most usefully be done to address the whiteness of the meanings attached to heritage? What is problematic about the and? Arts, culture, and heritage. Well, it sort of implies that no one else has a heritage. Um, you know, we all have an, an inheritance. And whether those have an equal weighting or value in our system, in our culture, is, is another question. Um, so that easy conflation exists with a lot of other subtle codes that we should start to interrogate as artists. This one has been bothering me for the past year, but why, what does the West actually mean? Why is it called Western values when it encompasses New Zealand and Australia? Quite the opposite lines of latitude, longitude to America and, and Britain. Um, lazy things that we say like Western heritage, Western values, the Western traditions without recognizing that they've actually been a polyglot uh, sort of different ideas from all over the world. And if we mean white culture, not Western, then why don't we just say that? Why don't yeah. we say, you know, I guess it's because of periods and embarrassment about facing some of the more shameful episodes in which whiteness was celebrated. If we're genuine and have integrity as artists, we shouldn't be shying away from those stories and from, from you know, in, yeah, being inquisitive as to what heritage meant in the past and what it meant, what it means now. You can be honest about it. Um, to the second point that you make about, well, it's the language, isn't it? Jewels. Um, <laughs> jewels of our culture that these well, you know, respected institutions and, and, and companies are, should be considered jewels on the one hand. It also feels that they've been bereft of new ideas for, for quite a long time. And whilst I profess personally a love for Shakespeare, I don't think there's anything particularly radical now about having ooh, a black Iago. Or, <laughs> you know, I think um, we can start to reevaluate where the jewels are, where the wealth is. And if there's any or any connection between what's happening with pulling down Ed Colston statues and questioning who we venerated and who we've ignored, you know, we should start to reframe what is a jewel, artistically speaking, for modern Britain, not, not an arcane 500-year-old version of it. Mm. And we have a, a question from one of our guests watching, Sue, and she asks, you know, th that you make a really interesting point about high culture, but how much do you think that the lack of broad cultural education means that many people feel that high art is, for the, is not for them? Yeah, I do think music education, um, artistic education in general is lacking right now. Um, but that's because of seismic cuts to budgets in schools and the ability, you know, for teachers and facilitators to, to provide those cultural ex experiences. But cultural experiences are happening anyway, irrespective of, it's just what, what we define as culture, is who is leading those cultural discussions. Are they happening through the aegis of venues and arts practitioners or are they happening offline in more informal settings with young people who are always going to want to make music perform dance act in various ways whether we're, whether or not we're part of the conversation is up to us yeah um 
Good question, though. Um, I think the problem with education, uh, introducing it, is that it sort of implies the reason you don't appreciate this art form is because you're ignorant of it, you've not been exposed to it. And in many cases, that's actually true. Like, how do you know you don't know lobster, don't like lobster? This is my analogy I've used probably <laughs> every week for you. If you just had nuggets every day, how do you know the caviar's for you, right? Mm. So there should be a spirit of, of exposing people to new things and new cultural practices that they might not have seen. But the idea that um, if you do have a better education, you'll suddenly jettison all of these lower art forms is problematic in itself too. If anything, my education, musical and historical, has given me a healthier appreciation for social history, community arts. Um, and even the term community arts is so loaded as it always sounds like the poorer cousin, the poorer relation of, of high art. That's something that we should be overturning, especially in this time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw like during this, this time period of, of COVID affecting minority communities a lot more. And, and prior to, you know, to COVID happening, we would see that, you know, crime and, and death still affected minor, minority communities more. And I like the sentence in your article, you said, uh, crime is, a, is more of a product of poverty than black DNA. And then I wonder if you can talk about that in relation to, to COVID, when you also say in your art, you, you speak about the true captains of industries being the bus drivers, the nurses, the teachers and the carers and the essential workers. So them being on the front line yet again, you know. Yeah. Well, my feelings are about this are pretty raw at the moment. I've just been on the national pre-tour uh, mm -hmm. to, to check out all the sites for the Black Peril 2020 Festival, as I mentioned. So I've been in Salford, Hull, Liverpool, around all of these actually predominantly white working class areas. And that's a problematic term in itself, just mm -hmm. checking out where we perform. Um, when I got to West India Dock in London Docklands, I had this visceral rage that I haven't quite been able to put into words yet. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a plaque that honours the legacy of the brilliant men who engineered the locks and the keys around the canal and so and such, who's a brilliant man, whose trade and commercial nous have helped him to navigate where in the morning. And it's just the hint of all this money and the hint of all the, how these canals are a feat of engineering mm -hmm. and trade and wealth. And not a, there's even a sign that says rum and sugar and there was nothing to commemorate the sacrifices of enslaved Africans, my ancestors who were murdered to produce that wealth. Um, it incenses me. And it relates to the question how again, I can't, I can't remember. But You're yeah, on we, point. You're on from, point. That time, from, from that time, we've inherited a culture that says very clever chaps in high places do stuff abroad that we don't really question, but we just know that they're very clever and they sound a particular way, they have a particular patter. Um, even RP, even posh accent I was taught to speak with happens through public schools and is inculcated through a whole number of institutions that tell us this is what a clever, clever chap sounds like. And we're taught to never really question the source of the wealth or really how clever they are. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're seeing is that these clever chaps that are running the country at present mm -hmm. are trapping us in a, a death hole got one of the highest rates of COVID-19 deaths per capita. In fact, the highest death rate in the world, even relative to the size of the population, even bigger than America and Brazil. And this should be a time that we interrogate. How clever are they really? Mm, mm. You know, how, in, how ingenious is it really to rape, murder, pillage, steal money, invest it, get paid compensation from government with interest that we're still paying off until 2015? And, you know, for people that quite right, understandably keep asking me, well, what's this got, why now? Why are you complaining about Colston and slavery now? We've got bigger fish to fry. What's the connection between COVID-19, coronavirus, and this anti-colonial perspective, this anti-racist perspective that I'm taking? Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that people can start to draw the threads because it's profitable for some people to have a police force which is militarized and kills black people. It's profitable to kill black people 300 years ago and it's still profitable to have a free market dogma which says just leave people to do their thing, don't ask too many questions and everything will be fine. So I probably went off on a bit of a tangent there. But no, it's, it's absolutely <laughs> perfect. 
<laughs> I've been um there's this I've been uh doing a lot of research lately and I came across this idea of of real good or authentic good and things that are real good benefit everyone in in which who is a part of this transaction is activity and if it's not real good then you will pay the price and I, I literally feel as though like we're we're seeing you know this manifest in real life and and like why is everything happening and I think for for many many people whether you know good or bad I know this situation COVID has been really detrimental to a lot of lives but I think that it has also been a, a, a really interesting and necessary time out for the world, for us as humans and as individuals. And I think we've all had an opportunity to like take a break from this madness, this, this what we call normal. It's actually not yeah. good normal. And- No, it's not. I've noticed a sort of assault on mental health, mm -hmm. an assault on our sense from the media and from mainstream political parties that are, we just see a picture of Boris wearing a mask. <laughs> no content. We don't know should we be official wear a mask? Is it official? Michael Gove isn't wearing one. Rishi Sunak's telling us to go out and have a pint on Monday. So it's a sort of ambiguity that feels like it does feel like a war on the mind. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that enforced timeout that we had, that sort of forced Sabbath, enforced Sabbath as a friend of mine called it, was really important to give us the time to start to connect these dots. Mm -hmm. Why am I running up and down? spending an hour and a half, two hours just getting from A to B every day. Why am I buying lots of clothes? Who am I trying to impress? The number of bonfires and skips that I've smelt and seen respectively outside my house and in my area, because people are just getting rid of excess stuff that they thought they needed but realized they didn't really. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that epiphany is particularly dangerous for the economic model that we have at the moment, which is consumption based, which is you know, rent based as well. And we all need to go out to work and so pay our rents to the landlords. And that's what keeps this bizarre engine turning. Mm. No, it, it really should stop. It really should stop. And do you see this timeout also being connected to a, a timeout for, for people to get their, their, you know, to, to, to look into their mental health, to do a, a bit of a, an observation, connect, reconnect to humanity. And you talk a bit about how, you know, young, younger and multi-ethnic generation Britons are just demanding that we confront uncomfortable truths. And we see the protests in the, in the, the protests around the world. And do you, I believe that it's connected to people having a timeout and being able to connect to humanity. Do you also agree or yeah. what are your thoughts? I do. And I think it's even more clear parallel between the black peril history that it looks at and the modern one time because then there was not only Spanish flu a hundred years ago and uh, all of the concerns and terror around an epidemic, a new epidemic in 1918-1919. There's also the end of war and an opportunity for people to come together and start to reflect what was the point of that sacrifice? Was it worth it? Do I have a home fit for a hero or not? Am I paid a decent living wage? So people were asking profound questions of the system. Bolshevism was a new threat, a new thing on the horizon. Russia had just turned red. And you can see today the same sort of cocktail of ideas, of questions being asked, radical solutions, maybe a post-capitalist world, a post-racism world, if, even if we can't live in a post-racial one in the short term, um, that I'm seeing the heavy lifting and the hard work that's going into preventing that recognition that you're talking about. That's what particularly concerns me. Having studied this history 100 years ago, people will probably think I'm hypersensitive, but every poster I walked past in the north of England that spoke about the public health risks of COVID all had a black or Asian person in the poster. Could be just a coincidence? I don't think so. And then in the past week, I've heard Leicester in lockdown because of sweatshops, Indians, Sweaty, uh, what was the other place? Bradford. Again, it's all subtle dog whistle. I mean, I'm not going to tell you what the demographic of Bradford is, but, you know. Um, <laughs> there was a case of Eastern Europeans in Malvern, and it's the idea of weaponizing immigrants as the source of this virus. Black Lives Matter protests, not wearing masks, having street parties in Brixton, mm. and not blaming actually official negligence. Mm -hmm. How on earth can it be that Cuba's had 100 deaths, Vietnam's had 
virtually none, no deaths at all. These are poor countries relative to us and with different economic and political ideals. And yet here we are, the fifth richest, largest com- economy in the world with the highest rate, death rate per capita. Hmm. I think that we should, I think we should let your audience, let our audiences know a little bit more about your flyover show. And, and I guess I would like for you to, to tell us a little bit more about it, but also I have a question as well. And you talk about the flyover show being disruptive to have the highest quality of artistic delivery in one of the most ignored corners of the city. And when you talk about it, can you talk a little bit about why you thought that was important, a challenge? Sure. Well, it goes back to the first um, question you asked about tradition breeding excellence. And I was very aware in my corner of, of Hockley in Birmingham, where I lived at the time, um, there was a concerted effort to foister onto us a sort of American narrative of urban decay and gun crime. 50 yeah. cents, get rich or die trying posters yeah. everywhere in our hood. You wouldn't see it in the more affluent middle class areas of Birmingham. And this incensed me as, as an MC, as a rapper, as somebody who's aware of Br- Britain and Birmingham's really rich hip hop community. I'm like, can we get a billboard? <laughs> but anyway, um, and I was aware that we have a tradition, you know, black British people in Birmingham have a very strong tradition that includes Steel Pulse, Joan Armour Trading, um, an inheritance that gives a young musician like Laura Mvula, Shabaka Hutchins um, mm-hmm. and myself a context to go on and create things in the future, you know. Mm-hmm. So when I hear a young musician like Ruben James, who's performed at Flyover Show, and the first time he was like 16, 17 when he did it, um, to now making the incredible moves that he's making, he knows full well that that's a stronger statement he can make because he comes out of a tradition, didn't just emerge in a vacuum. Um, that's why the Flyover Show was put on. And because these, for a good decade, since certainly the London riots, the Mark Duggan riots, they tried to make black and gang coterminous as though just that's what black people do. And it's, it's getting increasingly offensive to me because the things that we're accused of, if you look historically, mm-hmm. we're not the culprits. We're accused of being hypersexual and sexually aggressive. Mm-hmm. And just look at history. They have literally built a, a tunnel from the female slave dungeons to the bedroom of the slave master. Rape was an industrial project in slavery. Violence. We were beaten and worked to death. Bones ripped from sockets, ligaments torn apart because such was the duress that the work put us under. We were called lazy. We were called violent. So it's good for all people, all classes, all races to start to unpack the cognitive dissonance, to start to un- unpack why have they been lying about your black cousins, your brown cousins for so long? Why are they trying to separate us? Yeah. Um, and we can start to perhaps focus our art and creativity on more worthy focal points. Yeah. Speaking on art and creativity, with all of the unrest going on, do you, I guess there's two questions. Do you have any, what are your coping mechanisms for dealing with this stuff, watching it and seeing it? How do you not allow it to consume you in a negative way? I'll ask that, and then, yeah, and then I'll ask the next one. <laughs> um, I don't, it's, it's a definitely a mixed situation for me. Uh, I'm very careful to guard myself from viewing trauma on repeat. I haven't, I still haven't watched the entirety of the eight minutes and 46 of George Floyd being murdered. Mm. Um, and there was a time in early in lockdown where all I was watching was like, The Innocence Files and Trial by Media, a lot of Netflix things, which basically just show you how black people are systematically ripped off every time there's a a miscarriage of justice, we're on the wrong side of it. Um, So I had to carefully filter myself and guard myself against consuming too much of that because it merely just affirms our own oppression. The flip side is though, um, I felt, I feel this is cathartic. I think a lot of my peers and friends have come up to me and sent messages and texts like, I hope you're okay. Oh, tough, isn't it? It's too tough for you. I'm like, no, this, this is great, actually, because for, as long as I can remember, for all 42 years of my life, I've been going, did you see that? Did you, did you see the psychosis? The person just attacking me because of the color of my skin. This person's not, racism is real, it's happening. And I've been told I've got a chip on my shoulder, 
I need to calm down, not be so confrontational. Well, you know, just get over it. If you just stop talking about racism, it'll disappear. And it's like, yeah, okay, look at you, look at you, look at your evil racist people stepping on the neck of an innocent person and, and teasing and goading him. Now the transcripts are coming out. We're hearing they said, you, you, you stop speaking. If you can't breathe, don't talk then, as they killed him. And that level of sadism is something that I've seen. There are many cases in the UK that mean it's not just the uh, US phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sianda in Wales, the young boy was pushed into a river and the police did nothing. Um, Benga, uh, the man as well, a Congolese man who was choked out on an aeroplane whilst being deported to Congo. Um, and that level of injustice, when we hear it, is traumatic on the one hand, but it also is a release because I'm feeling like we can't, we shouldn't be taking this anymore. We don't have to take it anymore. And seeing, I'll say it a hundred times to anyone who wants to hear, seeing Edward Colson's statue collapse, fall into the river, was my Berlin War moment. I do understand a lot of white people are terrified by it. They're like, well, why? What's wrong? It's just a statue. Leave it alone. But for me, it felt like the removal of juju, of a hex, a spell being left, it lifted. Mm. And all of the attempts to do things legally and democratically for this long process failed. There seems to be a powerful metaphor in there. Mm. I, I certainly endeavoured personally to speak in a non-threatening way and to affect a middle-class accent so as not to intimidate my white, my white brethren. Um, <laughs> but it ain't worked. It hasn't necessarily afforded me the, the easy passage to the music industry that you'd expect. Um, so making accommodations for white supremacy doesn't yield the results that you think it will often. Although it's refreshing, Although it's refreshing. to not feel like you are, you know, that you've been by yourself this whole time. Now that folks are realizing that this is happening and they're like, oh, well, actually look at the arts sector. Look at, look at the lack of diversity in the arts even in places that are heavily populated with, you know, communities of color, you know, black people and um, South Asians and, you know, it's really interesting how now people have just like, oh, this has been happening. I just realized it. it's really interesting. And I guess, have you been asked to be part of things from organizations? Do you feel as though it's being a tick box or do you feel like you, you want to not take the opportunity or do you want to take the opportunity and use it as a platform to raise more awareness about this? Um, thankfully, I don't think I've been asked to be on many platforms where I feel that sort of deep conflict of interest. I certainly signed petitions and letters of solidarity with musicians and artists with varying levels of privilege. And that's just the nature of the music industry. If people have lost gigs. I do understand and I have a lot of empathy for them. Um, but I guess don't expect me to not mention that we live in this iniquitous music system. Don't expect me to just ignore the fact that, so what, you can't do Chekhov and tour Moscow next week. Um, if you're an artist, I think you should be looking at a way to do art. Otherwise you might be the sort of, yeah, parasitic energy that we don't need going forward. Uh, it's quite a challenging thing to say, but I do, I do think that we should all be evaluating like how, what's important to us? Why do I make music in the first place? Why don't I teach music? Is it just to keep the lights on in a flat? Is it just to pay rent? Is it just to be famous? Or uh, would I still do it if I didn't have any of the platform and the privilege that I, I definitely enjoy? So there, you know, the government has now announced, you know, 1.7 billion <laughs> promise to the arts. Well, budget. The five. <laughs> Don't forget the five. Um, <laughs> you know, what, 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 what would a funding regime more, you know, more enable to the grassroots look like? What needs to change? You know, should it just be doled out as it has been? You know, or, or like what? How can it be different? Well, look, cards on the table. Um, one of the things I found really uplifting about being in Durham at that time is that there were so many people agitating for some form of socialist change. A lot of young people. It was before the results of the twenty nineteen election, and I still erroneously thought that Britain was about to get swept up in a youth youth wave. What do they call it? Yeah, the youth wave. Um, <laughs> 
But I say that to say, I remember Jeremy Corbyn's speech pledging eight billion pounds to the Arts Council. Mm. The same speech, he made an announcement about the British Digital Corporation, this great idea that we could upscale what the BBC currently does and put a lot more funding and insulation around the BBC's independence. Yeah. And um, what do they do? They systematically destroyed that message. So I, I bet you most people have never even heard, heard that speech. Mm. Um, made it seem like broadband, free broadband was unachievable and unrealistic. And I tell you what, there's one thing I could do with right now, it's free super fast broadband because my connection is terrible. So yeah, I'm a little bit bitter, I'm a little bit salty um, mm -hmm. because people say, oh, isn't this great? We get virtually less than a seventh of what Jeremy Corbyn might have, might have got if, if he'd got into power. Um, I mean, we never know what would have happened, mm -hmm. but I feel that they're actually celebrating their proximity to Boris Johnson. We all know that that 1.75 Brilliant isn't going to go to the grassroots, it's going to go to the jewels of Britain's artistic institutions. And again, whilst I have some empathy, I don't feel an overwhelming desire or pity towards these well-funded theatres and institutions because just shut the building, just close down for a while. And maybe I'm being really naive and be happy for people in the comments or questions to, to pull me up on it. Maybe it's not that simple. Um, and I do think you have to furlough the lighting staff, the sound engineers haven't worked in a lot of these institutions. We need to keep those skilled workers retained. But the idea that theatre will somehow die because the old Vic shut for six months, a little <laughs> erroneous. Um, I don't want any of these institutions to shut mine, but I do want us to get our priorities straight. Um, so I know actors, I know musicians, I know dancers who are in a deep rut, are in a deep funk because they think, I can't do anything without someone to facilitate it, to make it happen for me. And actually, if you're not stimulated to create something in this time, even if you don't have the means, even if you're just writing a script without any idea of how it will get produced, or writing a monologue or performing it on your own, now's the time to respond. If not, what are you about? <laughs> I'll be that confrontational. What's your job, really? <laughs> You know, speaking about practicalities, you have a lot of, uh, you incorporate a lot of uh, technology in your music. Uh, to a musician who has never incorporated technology or to maybe young musicians or just newer musicians, do you have any kind of um, advice in regards to not necessarily reinventing themselves, but enhancing or um, you know, bettering themselves during this time period, using it almost as a CPD. I mean, that's how I'm thinking about it personally. Well, you know, technology, this, somebody, I think there's Winton, another conversation with any broke bro me down to me, or Eric Lewis, someone, this saxophone and piano is technology. It's 19th century technology, or piano is 18th. Um, the idea of practicing your craft is, a, you know, it's particular opportunity that we have in this again enforced lockdown period and it's one that we should take um, and I think about Knock Productions a homie from Blue Lab Beats is an incredible drum programmer who plays with uh, David and they're an incredible duo David plays more conventional instruments bass vibraphones he plays basically every instrument really well which is already scary uh, Knock on the other hand when he programmed it programs he plays that MP See, he plays the drum machine, the Akai drum machine, like a saxophonist is playing the saxophone. With that level of discipline, mm. finesse, technique, he spent hours honing that craft. And the, anyone who sees him knows that's the case. Uh, what do they say? 10,000 hours and all of that. So I think, yes, this has been and is a great opportunity to hone in on a craft. And I don't think we should have this demarcation between turntables, laptop, technology, great guitar, saxophone, arcane instruments for old school. You know, if you're serious about wanting to make a sound, then you'll spend hours getting, getting your voice heard on the saxophone. You'll spend hours finding your voice on the technology of the instruments. I think it's about having your end goal in mind, you know, having a sight of or platonic ideal of what you're going to sound like at the end of it. Knowing for what it's going to take you years to achieve it, now is a good time to start laying down some good practice habits or to try and, and do that thing without the prying eye of the public watching that you know you sound terrible at <laughs> privately before you take it out publicly, you know, 
don't embarrass yourself because you got it down by the there are a lot of artists who are like, oh, I just, I just don't feel creative. I just, I just can't. I can't. Do you have any advice besides turning off your social media, turning off negative news? Like, or do you have any advice to motivate or inspire people to, to practice or to be creative generally? Yeah, I hope I do. Um, <laughs> one of the things, one of the problems is how it interfaces with capitalism, right? And how when you're logging onto your Insta stream, and you see everyone, like someone's just done a sonata. Someone's just choreographed an entire half an hour piece on Instagram Live. You feel, I'm not doing enough. And that can really build status anxiety. Um, because again, how it interfaces with capitalism. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm not getting any younger. If I don't sell this amount of units or break into the mainstream by this age, it's over for me. And I think it's easy to say this, but it's important that... Um, we should try and jettison, try and divest ourselves from that sort of attitude that there's a time limit on creativity, that you have to have things done by a certain point. And instead, go in to yourself, meditate, do all the things that um, you don't normally have the time to do and let the creativity emerge. Absolutely. Um, you know, the reason I'm, though, quite militant about stop complaining that you can't act, get an acting job and act, or stop complaining you've lost a gig and just play your instrument, because there does come a point where I think everything that's happening now should incense you, should annoy you, should frustrate you, should inspire you. Mm. Um, there is a big disruption to the old world and musicians, artists in general have always been there to comment on that. Um, so I'm not saying there's a rush to get it out, but I, I am saying go inside and then, you know, this is the, the tricky part, stop scratching your navel and look at everyone else because up to 60,000 people have died. Seriously, people um, are dealing with loneliness, dealing with a loss of their world and confidence in a way that someone who's just been furloughed for three, four months, it's not the same. Somebody who's just lost a gig to travel abroad, it's, it's not the same, it's bad, but it's, it's not the same. So it's a chance to re-engage with our empathy, the chance to reconnect with like, what connects us to everybody else. Um, you know, we talked about early on how homes and neighborhoods during lockdown and made us see place differently, which mm -hmm. should also see beyond the regional because the virus doesn't sort of stop at Dover and go, well, I really shouldn't enter Britain right now. Uh, I, should, I should really think about the socioeconomic categories of people I affect. It really doesn't care. So uh, something I've been saying quite early on, look, COVID-19 isn't racist, but society clearly is. Yeah. If it's killing black and brown doctors disproportionately and, and, and targeting poor housing areas and stuff, then we all know what that's about. It's not a virus's decisions, it's, it's our decisions. Yeah. And, as, and as schools go back after lockdown, they're being pushed to focus on core subjects like English and maths. On what grounds should we be making case for the importance of teaching young people music? Well, there's lots. Um, you know, I don't want to get into the... Like, the creative industries produces the third largest sector in the country and, and all of this, but there is still an argument for yet yeah, it's going to provide some people with work and not just as performers, but an entire industry of people who understand what goes into making art happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's a different way that we should start teaching stuff as well, that you have a role as an audience member, as a curator, as a venue owner, as a promoter, um, so that people don't just get this erroneous idea of the only important person in art it's the prima donna on stage. It's, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, but you can learn all sorts of corollary things. It can facilitate a different take on those core subjects. I speak from experience. Um, really, with Nonogram, I hated maths at school, but with my the, the album before last, Nonogram, I got to really indulge a knowledge of ratios and proportions and geometry that I would probably not have followed to such a detailed conclusion had I not found the connection between music and maths and science, etc. Um, being an MC has helped me engage with literature and the spoken and written word in a completely different way. So I'd encourage people to not see these things as admissible, but actually they're quite interrelated. It's a problem that we have in the West, in white countries in general, it's compartmentalizing study um, and not seeing how all these things cross-pollinate and influence each other. Mm. Um, I also think at a philosophical level that song probably predates speech. 
Um, I, I believe that we developed our vocal cords and love of song from imitating bird, bird call um, and a love of music from, you know, and skills in being able to emulate different songs and sounds around nature. So I think there's every likelihood that it predates formal language and certainly the written word. So how important is music and song and engaging yourself in dance and in rhythm and music for your mental health? Incalculably important. And finally, in terms of creativity, what that means in a lockdown, I'm a musician that plays an improvised form of music, collectively improvising jazz. It's such an important facet that I think jazz is unique in having, that we're constantly having a dialogue with each other as musicians. We're listening and playing at the same time that teaches you to have to be resourceful and responsive in a way that not every other idiom does. And when we're dealing with the loss of work, loss of homes in some instances, loss of health and loved ones, um, the loss of security around you, having a framework to be creative and improvise is invaluable. Yeah. And the, and the idea, um, you know, if, if, we're talk, if we just talk about resilience a little bit, you speak in your mm. article a bit about how some communities have been struggling this whole time. So in these particular conditions, they don't find it necessarily easy, but they're not, they're able to, I think, cope a little bit more and understand how to navigate this, you know, on you know, this terrain of, of uncertainty. Um, do, do you mm. want to speak a little bit about resilience and, and I guess connecting that to this, you know, going back a little bit to this idea of, um, of our heroes and, you know, the, the traditions you've come out of and even mentioning, you know, tomorrow's warriors and, and different resilient other folks who you, you've drawn your, your strength from. Cool. There's a lot in there to unpack as well. It's good. <laughs> you don't have to um, it all. <laughs> yeah, right. Resilience. Resilience to start there. Um, yeah, I do think the art form that I play, the experiences I have have granted me a certain resilience, but Let's level here. Let's have an inside conversation, Hannah Biel. Like, I don't know if you felt the same, but as you feel the impending doom of economic collapse all around you, this could be incredibly naive and insensitive, but as a black person, I'm sort of like, I don't care how that looks. Because if you're like me, you think, well, we've been here before. Black people have always been at the bottom end um, and had to deal with economic shocks and hardships and and privations in a way that not everybody else has. And so if I think about my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, dealing with um, a lack of material goods and having to make do with it mm -hmm. is historically been a period in which we've shone as black people. You know, I'm not saying that I'm embracing poverty by any sense, but I am saying um, this opportunity for redress and things being turned upside down, I think culturally being as resourceful, as resilient, as, uh, as responsive to change has been a good thing for black people. And I think it will be a good thing for everybody to sort of divest yourself from the notion that you are owed things, to divest yourself from the idea that if I just work hard, society will give me this thing, um, when that's actually not the way it's, it's been proven, that that's not actually the culture and the society that we live in. Um, a good friend of mine sadly passed away. One of the last things he did is recommend a book um, called Who Moved My Cheese. It's a really good self-help book. A lot of people have read it. It's well worth checking out. But it, um, it says something I think that's very relevant to this time that without a spoiler um, for those who want to read the book, is that we get so attached to, I should have my thing in this place, in this way, and we can sit down ruminating the loss of these things without realizing change is inevitable. Evolution is inevitable, and it's how we respond to those circumstances that really define us. And so that's, you know, I don't want anyone to get the impression that I'm belittling the real suffering that's out there and how painful it feels, especially if you're graduating from university right now or you've had a consistent gig or job, suddenly the rug's been pulled from under your feet. Mm -hmm. But um, I've had that rug pulled from under my feet a lot, many, many times, whether it's being signed to a label and they're not, when it was having a BBC gig and then suddenly they just cut all the, the entire program. And um, I've never had security, either as a child growing up or now as a musician. There's never been a sort of even period of income for me. I've had to be responsive and creative. 
just to keep above keep my head above water so i think that is actually a blessing in times like this for artists like me yeah. um creators like me it means that we're not as terrified of change mm. there's a question from uh robert in our in the comments and he asks do you in, do you think that the statue of colston should go into a museum in its present state and can you name three new or overdue candidates or statues to put on the spot? Um, I think it is already happening, going into a museum with the blood sprayed onto its hands and I think on its face and prick. I think it's something, something like really classic Bristol is sprayed onto his back, you bastard. I don't know what they said, but something very, very Bristol. Um, so good. Yeah, I think that's actually the perfect fitting place for him in a museum with the graffiti still on. Um, in terms of the statue discussion, um, I think it did everything that it's supposed to. If we were to take every statue down of a British hero who's got a problematic past, you'd have to get rid of Churchill. You'd have to get rid of Clement Attlee. You'd have to get rid of many left-wing and right-wing people who have very problematic attitudes towards empire and black people that was the nature of Britain to be racist. So I don't think, I'm not saying statues shouldn't be the target, but they shouldn't be the main target. And I've been saying explicitly, even though it makes people spit out their Chardonnay, reparations, because that's the obvious thing here. You're dealing with a system that's built on inequity in which we were still paying interest to slave masters until five years ago. Yeah. And no, when you bring up the subject of reparations for us, and by us, I mean, yes, principally the black descendants of enslaved Africans. But then when you look about what that restructuring of society would, would look like, we're talking about bursaries, grants, uh, opportunities for poor disenfranchised black people to get a leg up, right? And then what does the rest of the country look like when you've got working class people asserting themselves, creating new opportunities, and we're, we're taking the money from those few mouths, we're talking about the Earl of Harwood, David Cameron's ancestor, mm. still rich today, David Cameron's still rich today. We're talking about spreading the billionaire wealth about, so there can be a few more millionaires perhaps, as opposed to who needs to be a billionaire. Anyway, um, I think that it's an important moment to recognize there's a common sense approach to all of this. Mm. I think if any of us common sense people were running in response to COVID-19, we would shut everything down really, really quickly a common sense response to everything that's happened with George Floyd and Edwin Colston's legacy is to talk about reparations. And this week, I've heard them talking about sweatshops in Leicester, modern slavery and how county lines is like slavery, when it's definitely not like the old slavery. Uh, it just seems like a lot of diversionary tactics. What was the one today? Uh, Rory Bremner in blackface. Who should be in blackface? Who shouldn't? But let's not get sidetracked with blackface and statues and totemic arguments and instead go to the root, which is always the economics. I mean, just finally, because it's an important point that relates to the black peril. Mm -hmm. um, the reason black economic justice is always pushed off of the agenda and always seems communistic and excessively Marxist is because if you liberate black people, you liberate everyone, then let people ruminate on that. That's why black liberate, Akala makes this point excellently in Natives. That's why black liberation figures like Fela Kute, um, John Coltrane, Malcolm X, they can adorn student, Che Guevara, they can adorn student bedrooms, you know, and still do today. White liberation figures, not so much because it's got a problematic association with it. And that's something for us to all get our heads around, you know. I think it's really interesting how we see how white supremacy is not only affecting our communities, but also how much it's affecting white communities and, and just crippling them. And I think as, mm. as they start to realize how bad it's, it's playing a role in our communities, it's, they're just starting to, when they realize that they realize the framework and how in which it's affecting them as well, which is interesting. And, you know, yeah. a lot of folks, as we start to, you know, bring up these truths and, and, and shake what is normal. Um, it brings up a question from a, uh, one of our, one of the comments. Um, someone has a question for you, Sue, and she says, what if we put important, uh, a port an important black person beside each white statue? 
to give it mm. more of a balanced story. And, and for me, another bit to that is, what does it mean to have those statues up in your face? It's a bit problematic there as a response because yeah. is equity having brown and black faces in positions of power? Mm. We've got Pretty Patel, we've got Kwashi Kwarteng. They're not necessarily emblems of equality. Um, and it's the same tension, I think, that exists in feminism. I like to consider myself an ally to feminists, uh, but I guess women would have to tell me if I am or not. <laughs> um, the, the point being, the same tension exists. Have we fixed misogyny just by having more women in the boardroom? We've had two conservative female prime ministers. I don't think anyone could seriously argue that misogyny is, is over, that sexism was ended by Margaret Thatcher and Theresa May. Um, so just by having icons, it's, I understand the sentiment of it, but I think to provide context as to who is great and who do we venerate, who are our heroes and who aren't, there are so many black British, and I'll say this term advisedly, black British working class heroes, mixed race heroes from prehistory, from history, recent recorded history, William Cuffey, William Davidson, uh, Ro uh, Robert Wedderburn, who almost forgot his name, John Archer, the first London mayor born in Liverpool, and uh, these are black and mixed race working class heroes who mm -hmm. all of them over a century ago did great work in defining working class struggle for, for all of us. And I, I think if we were all taught about them, if they had not just statues, but an actual an awareness of who they were, then the idea of you know, Toby Young and his ilk put about of the work, white working class, you know, uh, would quite easily be debunked because there's never been a period in history that I've identified in which the working class in England was white. Never, never been the case. I she find, white, that is. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, a, there's another question coming in here. Um, hold on one second. I mean, I certainly understand the sentiment of wanting to create balance, but, um, I think kind of justice is more, is a more um, yeah, I've kind of dealt with that, but it's an interesting point. <laughs> I think justice is a more worthy goal than balance because uh, often you get black people or women doing the same jeggeries as white men have done for many centuries. And you, in, your, in your article, you, you talk about community youth workers from relatively fluent middle class backgrounds have been bused mm -hmm. in and out to deal with, you know, disaffected communities and outreach programs may often just be a requirement of funders rather than a sincere desire to diversify audiences or challenge inequality. And I find that that's also something in the Northeast that we also deal with. And, and I think that definitely resonates probably throughout the country. Do you want to speak quickly on that? Quickly or briefly? Yeah. Um, interestingly, going around on this tour, again, free Black Peril 2020, first of all, all of these areas that saw race riots 100 years ago have varying degrees of gentrification around them. I just found that a really interesting observation, whether it's luxury apartments going up, or they're on a car park now, or the Docklands are being advertised as beautiful waterfront properties when they're actually quite poor working class areas until quite recently. Um, I think that presents interesting challenges. Um, yeah, it presents interesting yeah, the challenges for us as creators and how we view our art in place again. Can you repeat the question though again? Because I know it's a specific Well, it's just, I was, I, was, I was on a chat yesterday on another call with a, or another interview yesterday. And we were, we were speaking about how some organizations put on these amazing projects for, to bring young people together or to help to combat the austerity that we've been feeling up here in the Northeast. And oftentimes those yeah. projects are really amazing, but they last for maybe six months or a few weeks or a year, and then it ends. And we were just talking about the, how that's so detrimental. And is, you know, do organizations have an obligation, if they find a program that really, really works, have, a, have an obligation to actually partner with other local organizations to help get that, that, get that going or create some kind of, I don't know, collaboration with other folks in other, in, around the country to put those in, you know, put those programs around. But the idea that yeah. 
they're getting funding to do something and just cutting it so short when it's over and then on to the next thing, on to the next community, on to the next thing. I think the connection is really, and the reason I started with that is areas are being gentrified, people are being gentrified, and there's a sort of parasitic relationship that's not discussed or uh, spoken about, honestly, which if these institutions were really concerned with having a dialogue and making their own spaces and organizations more comfortable for working class or black and brown people, then that would be the outcome. But often, um, whether it's orchestras, opera outfits, I'm not, I'm not targeting them as specific genres or art forms, but I've been in rooms where conversations have been had about, well, how can we get more diversity? And you can hear it, both an under and an overtone, that they will lose their funding if they don't have more poor people and more black people in their audience. And whilst it might produce some good outcomes, they won't ever be long-term because it is a box ticking exercise and it, they don't have a level of compassion or belief that these people have their own cultural expressions and valid stories. It's about basically filling these empty vessels with proper culture and then dropping them off at the end. And it, it, it follows the sort of the other bad practices that I've seen with the way that they've introduced new black writers in the theatre world or new black composers was sort of a conveyor belt that leads nowhere. Look at this wonderful development work that we're doing. We're finding new voices, new urban voices, new edgy stories. They get one commission, get one maybe one album, um, a bit of a push, and then they're dropped. And when we don't own the means of production, when we don't own the, the methods and ways of getting the message out there, it's a, a more precarious walk for us as artists and creatives. It's been, Hopefully been, that makes sense. Yeah. It's cool. been a lot. It's been heavy. I think everyone should read your article. Can you tell us a little bit about your tour, where people can find your work, where you're going to be next? Hashtags, just plug yourself, let us know what's going on so we can follow. Please do. Well, for the start there, please follow <laughs> me on your Twitters and your Instagrams and your Facebooks. It's just at Soweto Kinch. It's the same handle for all of those. Um, so from September the 14th to the 18th, I'm going to be staging this online festival with some incredible people. We'll be having a conversation with Loki, the rapper, Kehinde Andrews, Nicholas Payton, a great jazz musician, Jason Moran, another incredible. In fact, Nicholas Payton hates being called jazz. A little interesting <laughs> aside. Came up with, bam, black American music, because jazz is often a ghetto that stops us from escaping. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a lot of deep stuff with them and then staging these performances online from all these places that we go to. We're gonna to go to Liverpool, Salford, Cardiff, Newport, Docklands, and perform socially distanced but very engaging performances, film them and make them all available as content uh, online. So do follow the hashtag Black Peril 2020. I'm literally just starting it up now. The website should be live by Sunday, Monday coming, but um, just follow me and watch this space. Black Pearl 2020, it's, it's our. Um, but yeah, more broadly, I hope it is inspiring. I hope it hasn't just been heavy because no. I genuinely think, and I think, I think we're, I realized from this trip as well that we're often on different pages, we're on different, different stages. I've read different books, they've had different life experiences and I sometimes get impatient that not everybody's on the same page. But I think that demonizing black people was done deliberately to separate white people to be able to demonize them on the grounds of class. You excommunicated and expunged and repatriated black people a hundred years ago so that an entire class of people could be demonized. White women that decided to have mixed race babies were beaten, paraded naked in the streets. I'm discovering all this history now. Mm -hmm. And we still vilify people on benefits. We still, we still do that. So I, I say, no apology, black liberation means everybody's liberation. And it's something that we should be comfortable saying. I completely agree. I just want to be like, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm gonna uh, thank you so much for your words and your insight. And I hope that we get to hear from you again. And we'll definitely be, I will definitely be following your tour. And um, I hope that we cross paths in person again. Oh, well. yeah. <laughs>